Welcome. On today's show, we are going to be talking about self-awareness because if you're interested in self-mastery, thriving, or developing proficiency in any skill, the first step is to get out of your own way. So my name is Jeremy Sutton coming to you from Niigata, Japan. And I'm Simon Darimple coming to you from Bangkok, Thailand. And this is the Art of Awareness podcast, episode two. Speaking of self-awareness, you are now breathing manually. So today we're going to be talking about self-awareness because the self is sort of at the center of our experience. I think it was Alan Watts who pointed out back in his lectures called Out of Your Mind that every creature on the planet has the same unique experience and that's wherever they're looking out from, they are the center of their own personal universe. So we were talking about self-awareness since we all have to know about the fundamentals of that. So Simon, what are some of the fundamentals of self-awareness in your opinion? That's a good question. I think self-awareness is all about having an understanding of how your own mind works and understanding how other people's minds are different and similar to our own, understanding the tendencies that we have, understanding what circumstances in which we thrive and what circumstances perhaps hold us back um, understanding how we can take in new information. Do we work better on our own or in groups or what our interpersonal skills are like? And really understanding how we can work best, I think. It's understanding the conditions of your own mind first. And then from that position, then going out into the world and trying to understand where other people are coming from. And that's really the beginning of empathy in, in my in my understanding. What do you think, Jeremy? How about you? What are yeah. some of the fundamentals? Yeah. yeah, nice. I mean, I totally agree. Yeah, it's, it does start with self-awareness because, you know, we all work under good under different circumstances. Um, mm. You know, I'm currently working through Einstein's biography right now. And, you know, one of his one of his special skills was that he had this like insane ability to focus even when there was endless distractions going around. There's the stories of times when He's like watching the kids and he's basically got like a, a child in one arm and another kid like running around and he's doing equations on the board and you know someone mm. comes in and is like Einstein what are you doing and and he essentially is like one second I'm almost finished and he just gets like right through it you know uh, I don't have quite <laughs> quite strong abilities to focus so you know when I'm doing something like writing or uh, back in the days when I was doing more math I would um I needed a space that was quiet that was mm. you know more distraction free because that's kind of my my preferences. Mm. Uh, another example is that some people who are, you know, ADD on that end of the spectrum, um, I mm. can't remember, I was reading an article online and this guy was saying how, you know, he is diagnosed with ADHD and essentially he can't work at home because there's too many things in his apartment that distract him. Mm. He likes to go out into maybe a public library or even read at a park so that, you know, sort of when his attention deficit kicks up, he has something to look at, to pay attention to, and then he can kind of let that take his, his awareness for a minute and then come back to you know his reading or his studying so he can produce his work so yeah we're all different you know we all have different uh, needs and I think self-awareness is definitely starts right there mm. so how do you think self-awareness c connects to the idea of multiple intelligences and the way in which we learn can be different to the way in which other people learn do you think there's a connection there and how do you think that relates to what we're talking about yeah for sure you know um, I think Howard Garner and his uh, his multiple intelligences is a pretty strong theory of learning right now. I mean, at the very least, we can all see how there's different parts of our lives. And, you know, just because I'm really good at music or math doesn't really mean I'm good at social skills or, you know, in interpersonal skills. Absolutely. And so, you know, one of those, one of the multiple intelligence is basically your self-awareness, your uh, self-intelligence. And, mm -hmm. you know, we all vary. We all vary on our natural levels of how aware we are. And that being said, we can all increase our awareness, you know, even if we're musically inept, we can increase our musical ability. And such is the fact that, you know, regardless of how our interpersonal uh, intelligence is, we can still increase that ability through practice, through knowledge, through reading, through wisdom traditions, and a whole bunch of other uh, practical techniques. And would you say that it's more important to focus on the areas where you're weak, or more important to identify the areas where you're strong, mm. perhaps? Um, linguistically or 
or mathematically or whatever your area of strength is, do you think it's more important to focus on those areas and just keep improving those? Or is it more important to have more of a level playing field in terms of your understanding and, and which intelligence you're employing at a different time? Right now, this is like really a philosophical debate on some level um, because, you know, basically it's like, oh, you know, should you work at what you're already good at or should you try to like bring your exactly. lowest skills up to up to snuff, so to speak. Absolutely, and, yeah. you know, there's definitely two different fields in this, you know, um, on the one level, you know, I think we all we, we all love to be good at stuff. You know, it's a, it's an it's inherently enjoyable when we find an activity that we're good at. And so, mm. you know, if we're going to, you know, really contribute the most to the world on one level, the, ba the way that we can do this is if we take whatever our inherent talents are, and if we can really run with that torch to the next level, then right. that's where we're going to be able to kind of, you know, maybe get to the forefront of that field and go further. Right. However, we're probably going to, we're probably going to reach excellence in that area in which we're most naturally suited to achieve excellence in, right? Why would you necessarily swim against the tide, you know, when, when that's not who you are on a fundamental right. level, right? Yeah. We are, and we are all different. And we're and we're all malleable too, though you know. But the point is that like if you're like if you're like four ten, then like it's probably not your destiny to be like the NBA's dunking champion. Right, right, exactly. Like, uh, and that's not to say that someone who's four ten can't dunk. If it happens, I'll be like, wow, you just like hats <laughs> off, my friend. But the point is yeah. that uh, <laughs> you should focus. You should focus on the things that you kind of have an inclination for. And most of us are going to naturally drift towards those anyway because you know, you're young and, or at some point you're young, you do something, you're good at it and you're going to get positive feedback and you're going to be like, whoa, right. you know what? I, I'm enjoying this feedback. <laughs> I'm enjoying the, the learning, how easy this is coming to me. You know, mm. what's the fastest way to get bored of science or math? It's like, this doesn't make any sense to me. And all of a sudden you're just like gone as soon as you enter a math class. You know, mm. I think a lot of people have that experience. But that yeah, being so. said, there's, um, you know, there's a huge benefit in in identifying what skills you do need to work on because you know no matter how, no matter how good we are at basketball or no matter how good we are at like you know leadership or business or math or whatever your thing is computer programming uh if you don't have interpersonal skills that's going to be a major detriment and if you don't have interpersonal skills then you're not going to have a good foundation to con connect with others and then to thrive in your in your area and you know brian tracy talks about uh, in his book accelerated learning how there's going to be some key skills for whatever we're doing that are going to leverage our results a lot farther. So mm -hmm. we do need to identify, you know, what skills that are critical to the success that we're looking for, you know, whether that's uh, in a, a marriage or a career or a sport or an art, what skills am I lacking, but that are critical to my success. And even if I'm not good at those skills, I'm going to need to find out some way to sort of handle that part of my life. <laughs> so and are there some of those skills that cross those different areas of our lives? Are there some of those skills that we can leverage, you know, in particular that will enable us to achieve excellence in multiple areas of our life? Or do we have to define exactly what outcome we want in exactly which area before we can decide which skill to employ or to work on? Right. That's a that's a great question, because, you know, there's so many like advanced topics that do just require like a, a really specific micro skill. Mm. However, you know, there's a couple things and I think, you know, self-awareness is basically one of these fundamental skills um, that does kind of leak out, eek out into everything. Because, you know, for example, accelerated learning techniques are insanely helpful no matter if you are working at, you know, working at a school or working in a business. Because if you can learn fast, then when a new challenge is presented to you, you're going to be able to... Uh, you know, figure out those learning in a way that matches the way that you learn best, you know. So is that a kind of a, a form of strategic thinking? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you're you're looking at the whole system and saying like, hey, how do I need to position myself in this system in order to mm -hmm. make a to go with the current? You mentioned you don't want to swim against the current. Yeah, exactly. Right. You wanna, if you can position yourself in that stream, that's going to be ideal for you. Then, mm -hmm. of course, you know, you're going to have a much better, uh, better time in achieving your different goals. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we talk, me and you, we talk a lot about things like psychological development and mm -hmm. how, how the mind changes over time. I, I think it's fair to say that you and I have a peculiar interest in the, in the human psyche, um, and <laughs> just, and experiences of like philosophy. And, you know, a lot of these are rooted in our own experiences. Why don't you explain a little bit, um, you know, how has self-awareness and, just this interest in psychology how is it has it affected you in any positive way or negative way or, you know what's the experience yeah 
Um, I mean, I think that's true. We've, we've definitely both had quite different experiences of, of coming to some some form of self-awareness or at least initial initial feelings of, of coming to self-awareness. For me, uh, my it comes down to what was my initial map of the world? What was the initial uh, understanding I had of, of how things worked around me and how I was to function you know, in, in this landscape? And that came through my upbringing as a Christian in a very loving, caring Methodist uh, home setting when I was uh, growing up in England. And that definitely informed the way that I looked out on the world and what I saw when I looked out into the world. You know, it was very much a sealed environment, really. It, I had answers to questions before I'd really asked those questions, you know, about why I was here, what the purpose of my life was, how I was going to assign value to different things in my experience, uh, what was going to happen to me after I died, how I was going to live the good life. All these, all these answers were already pre-prepared for me. So when I came to awareness of myself in the world and awareness of myself as an individual, it was with that map in hand. I, I was already, I, I already knew the answers. You know, I didn't have too many questions really while I was growing up. The, the answers were, were clear and provided full understanding as far as I was aware at that time. And then when I, when I became sort of probably around 16, 17, the classic kind of questioning years of a, of a teenager, certain, certain doubts started to creep in. And I started to feel that the map wasn't really covering all the territory, you know, or it, or it was a map that, that gave all the answers, but why is my map better than someone else's map? Hmm. Why, why is this Christian map better than a Buddhist map or, a, a, or a, a map that comes from the Muslim faith or a map that comes from Hinduism or a different culture? Or I mean, what, how would I think differently if I, if I grew up in India or if I happened to be born in, in another culture, or another part of the world with a totally different understanding of, of their territory? And I, I mean, I don't, and I don't think that was peculiar to the fact that I was raised as a Christian. I think I would have reached that that level of questioning if I was if I was born in a, a different culture. I don't think it was uh, a singular experience in that sense. Um, but it did get to the point where I needed to to really go out and, and explore the territory for myself uh, without a map, you know, without and try and leave that behind and go out and and discover my own answers and discover my own my own experiences without having a reference for it predetermined in my own mind. Uh, so I went to university to study religion, to study Christianity specifically. Um, and then I went through a deep identity uh, shift, really, by the time I by the time I arrived to university, probably within about two weeks, I had decided that I wasn't going to find a church. I wasn't going to join that community. I wasn't going to keep feeding that identity. I was actually going to put that down and, and try and discover who I was, um, you know, beneath that, beneath that, uh, that identity that I had already learned, you know, that was already sort of in my blood, in my cells, in my DNA, what was I beneath that? And so that started my journey of, of self-discovery, of self-awareness, because it's really, I think that's the key is it's a process of discovery, really. It's like un unraveling the layers of the onion and uh, <laughs> it, keeps, it keeps going down. I haven't got to that core yet, you know, it, it just, each time I, I feel like, uh, you know, because as soon as I, I wasn't a Christian anymore, I was like, I didn't allow myself to, to sit in that uncertainty for too long, even though I told myself I had all kinds of ideas about uh, how I was going to walk off to find the, the, the borders of my territory and, and, and really be a, a you know, revolutionary in my thinking and, 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 and decide for myself. But of course, as soon as I let go of one identity, I immediately grabbed onto another one, uh, which was the polar opposite of what I used to be. You know, I was like, okay, let go of Christian. Okay, grab atheist. Yeah, atheism. Yeah, that's strong. And that's, that's got a, a certainty about it in a totally different way. It's totally different from Christianity. But the fact was, I jumped onto that certainty, you know, that right. feeling of, because that feeling of letting go of your map, of letting go of your references, of, of letting go of that one certainty, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're very quick, the mind is very quick to grab onto another certainty. Right. Because it's a different kind of certainty. It has a different flavor to it, a different feel to it. Right. But fundamentally, it, saves, it serves the same purpose right. in your life, or at least that was my experience at the time. You know, And so it's a consistent process of trying to let go of, of these uh, references I have and let go of these maps that I that we naturally accumulate as right. as thinking humans I think you know as as self-aware people it's important to try and uh, to try and be aware of, of these maps that we pick up along the way for sure and 
So that brings me to the same kind of question for you. I mean, what do you right. think was your initial map and uh, and the territory yeah. that you look from? Well, you know, it's our styles of, uh, or I guess our, where we've come from in this life are like so contrasting. I mean, obviously you come from the UK, I come from the Northwest United States, uh, mm. but we have so many parallels as well. And, you know, I hear your story and, you know, it's, in some ways, it's so parallel to mine, and yet so different. Uh, in some, in right. some ways, they don't intersect at all. But walking just... up the same mountain from just different sides. <laughs> Ab- the... Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, um, you know, inter- this is a, a lot about like psychological development as well. I think we should come back to the topic of psychological development, but uh, because I think both of our stories kind of exemplify the general path that people take. Um, yeah. But yeah, so you know, my background comes from a, almost the opposite uh, in the sense that you know, my family, <laughs> my family is. Uh, very sensitive to any religious themes. My my parents are uh, two loving, great parents. And if ever there was uh, evidence that it doesn't requ- that uh, morality doesn't require religion, I think my parents are just ideal exemplars of that. Because everything I learned about being a good person came from watching my parents. You know, uh, someone stopped on the side of the road and their t- their tires flat. You know, my parents are going to be, hey, are you guys okay? Do you guys have someone to call? Do you need get? Do you need a hand? And you know, so from a a long time out, I can always remember whenever I could see somebody who needed help. And if I was there, if I was free to, you know, lend a hand, uh, that was just, you know, what I did because I saw that from them first. So, mm. you know, my parents are also not scientists there, but uh, we definitely come from more of the um, atheist agnostic spectrum, you know, not mm. uh, secularist, uh, to say the least, you know, my biggest identity was probably just, you know, to my family and to my town, to being a Cleelum warrior at my high school, to my <laughs> basketball team. Um, go Warriors. And, <laughs> yeah, go Warriors. And uh, I don't know, at the same time, though, I was very locked into a, a singular perspective. I mean, um, I was very, I had a very strong reaction to any time anybody would uh, ever kind of mention religion to me. I was just whew, like, I felt the burn of that real quick and like would respond to it. I you know, it's like, get it's out funny, of- It's funny to think about how you and I would have uh, got along, you know, back in those <laughs> times, right? When I was like burning with the fire of the spirit and you were like, no, none Don't of that touch religion. Me. <laughs> you know, we probably would have been like, like, yeah, uh, it would have, it would have just passed and, uh, but funny enough, it would, it would have sort of been like the two Norths of a magnet. Exactly. You know, right. That yeah, yeah. Just like straight, straight past each other. And, really? um, you know, so, but Similarly, the, the the real parallel is that I too was locked into a single viewpoint, you know, and that this was the only way. Um, and you know, to me, it was just like you'd have you'd have to be crazy to think that. I, I can't even imagine how, uh, like, why do, like why does someone think this is true? And right. it took a lot of a, a totally different experience of sort of coming to awareness for me to kind of break free of that initial like grace, uh, grasp and to mm-hmm. even allow the thought that hey, wait a minute these wisdom traditions actually are a lot of really intelligent people have been thinking about these things for thousands of years and it would it's really arrogant to believe that there's no wisdom that there's no truth in after thousands of and hundreds of thousands of people thinking about these topics writing about these topics it uh you know look introspecting and you know, even though perhaps all of the explanations, you know, no matter how much you introspect, you're never going to come to figure out like the functioning of the neocortex. Don't get me wrong. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to understand the neocortex to understand what it is to be alive. You know, the, to your experience of existing is mm-hmm. is essentially uh, what everyone's kind of looking for. Actually, Joseph Campbell says that he says uh, in one of his one of his books that people aren't really looking for the meaning of life, but the experience of living. Right. And although I personally think that uh, finding meaning in your life is one way to experience life most deeply, if do you, you have... Do you find meaning or do you think you ascribe meaning? Do you, I do you think, think you choose your meaning. I think, you know, you have to... Uh, we don't have to. There's there's sort of two roles here. Um, and we're here we're really coming up to like a shift in consciousness and uh, like you, something you can really you can really map on a psychological development stage that is basically a universal transition. And this is kind of the transition from living the story that your culture tells you, living the story that your home base tells you is your story, and essentially having your community write your story, your place and time and space. And then there's a shift that it, you don't have to make that shift. You can technically own that story for your own and live that story and make it your own. But it is uh, in some qualitative way, a next step to take the pen yourself and then kind of write your story from there. And right. 
that taking up of the pen is is the sort of right, ascribing the meaning to yourself. Like, what are you going to take as meaningful to you? Mm. And that reminds me of uh, Viktor Frankl, you know, and his book uh, *Man's Search for Meaning*, how he talks about the the drive to find meaning, logos, you know, logotherapy, his his form of psychotherapy that, that grew out of his experiences in the in the concentration camps, you know, and how we do have to choose meaning for our lives. If if when we lose meaning or when we when we decide it's time to make our own meaning, that can be a scary step, you know, but it, it really is the first step to authoring our own lives, as you mentioned. And what age were you when that happened, when that shift um, came about in your life? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really hard. It, there's, a, there's a couple experiences that really sort of shook me. Um, you know, number one was I, I did travel a bit. Uh, and you know, right when I was 18, I immediately went to South America for uh, a month after I graduated. I was uh, doing a year of volunteer work in Paraguay. And, and I, you know, the very first experience that sort of shook me loose was that, you know, I, we, it was the time of the World Cup uh, the, in that when we left. Nice. And, you know, I, I found first myself... First time you'd heard of soccer. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I knew soccer, but not football. That was the thing. <laughs> uh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Now you learn. But, uh... You know, I, and I was sitting there and I was watching, I was watching matches with my host family. And, you know, of course, in, in South America, uh, in Paraguay, they are, they are, they love football, you know. And I, you know, it, was, it just got me thinking like, you know, I don't know any of those people on the pitch. I literally have not ever met any of them, nor have I ever crossed paths with them, nor have I, do I have anything in common with them as far as I can tell. And, right. but so why do I feel connected to those ones and not those ones? Like, and mm. I, I could feel, basically I could feel my identity starting to separate itself from something I didn't even notice before. And that was that I inherently had an American identity. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was like, I remember the first time when somebody was just like talking about, talking crap about America. And I was just like, I would, didn't even, I didn't, if you would ask me, Hey Jeremy, do you feel American? I would have been like, yeah, kind of, I guess. Am I? And as soon as someone right. mentioned uh, one bad word, I was like, how dare you? <laughs> Right, a good a good way to kind of know what you what you hold dear to, in terms of your own personal identity is when someone attacks it or calls it into question, you know, or presses that button. Sometimes you don't you're not even aware it's there. I, I had a similar experience myself in terms of my Englishness. You know, like when I was in England, it was like a fish in water. I wasn't aware of what water was. I wasn't aware of what Englishness was because it was everything around me. It was my whole world. You know, was was drenched in Englishness, and then I had to leave and and come to. To Thailand and, and go traveling to different places and talk to other people and experience other cultures and people would would criticize England or, or would make fun of England and I would feel a certain you know make fun of the queen or I'd I'd sort of feel myself you know uh rising up inside you know and, and getting ready to defend something that it's like well what, what am I defending here what am I actually what am I trying to protect and who's trying to protect this thing it's, it's a strange a strange experience to have I think and sometimes you do need to leave the area of your initial map you know in order to to see it for what it is because otherwise it it encompasses your whole world you know it's, right. and it's about kind of breaking out of that initial identity that can be that can be the question of difficulty i think mm. for lots of us absolutely and unless you're forced to or unless the circumstances of your, of your life bring you to that point it can be difficult to to choose it you know if you are a fish in water how do you how do you explain what water is right when it's everything you know Exactly. And it doesn't, you don't have to like, you know, we've been fortunate enough to uh, experience a number of uh, traveling opportunities, living abroad for multiple years and multiple continents. And I think it's important to note, though, it doesn't require such a sort of like overt change of, of dr a drastic shift of location to experience such a transformation. Because, you know, essentially, we are talking about things that are uh, a shift in the mind that is, that is fundamental to psychological development. I mean, when we look at, when we look at a one-year-old compared to a three-year-old, compared to a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a 12-year-old, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no argument, there's no uh, debate as to whether a five-year-old and a 12-year-old simply see different things when they look out the world. Uh, right. there's, there's no question that a 12-year-old has certain capabilities that a seven-year-old or a five-year-old just don't have because of their psychological development right and they're just looking out on different worlds like you say i mean they're they're literally looking out at different a different quality of, of existence you know yeah. it's like a different appreciation of what they're looking out on it's fundamentally different yeah. yeah and and these changes have been studied like pretty extensively and most and they seem to be universal across the globe i mean a simple example is just um i, I can't remember the exact age differentiation but it's something like between like three and five where or maybe five to seven but 
there's at one point you'll show a child two beakers of water and one will be uh, or one beaker of water and two glasses. One is short and fat and one is tall and skinny. You'll take the tall and skinny one and you'll pour the water into the short and fat one. And then you'll ask the child, you know, which one had more water? Well, at some point the child thinks the tall one has more water. And at some point the child comes to realize that it doesn't matter which one the water's in, that both of them have the same water because you're moving the same water back and forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is like literally a, a capacity of the mind that is not available until you reach a certain age. Now, it gets a lot more sensitive, however, when we start talking about uh, adult development. And, you know, there's the Robert Keegan is a adult developmental psychologist at Harvard. And, you know, he has done a lot of research on essentially the, on how the mind, it doesn't just stop changing once we hit 25. You know, right. we can continue to evolve our perspective, our talents, our skills, our knowledge, our learning, our wisdom. These are all things that continue to grow and evolve over time or... Mm -hmm if we don't actively foster them, they, they kind of fall a trail off until we kind of deteriorate. <laughs> so, with age. Yeah. And, I'm cool. mm. and so, you know, there is a time, uh, basically it's common for every person to have at some point in their life, only one single perspective that they can take. It's, you know, it's part of growing up. It's uh, that five-year-old when he looks at the water uh, and the different beakers, he can't, possibly fathom how the water could be the same amount in both sides because it's so obviously taller that it must be more it's it's not about it's not about uh, un coming to understand it it's just it's not there uh, that's all they can see it's right? only can see is his perspective or her perspective so we all grow up in a single perspective and mm -hmm. there comes a point in our life where uh where we have the ability to break free of that single perspective and we have the ability to start taking on multiple perspectives. The challenge is that just because we can do that thing doesn't mean we do do that thing. <laughs> so right. that is uh, that is where some of the difficulties come in and basically how our experiences of kind of noticing for the first time of our initial kind of grasp on a single perspective um, you know, and then coming, breaking free of that and then sort of being open and open to the possibility of multiple perspectives. That is a qualitative shift. That is a, a and is one of the shifts that that uh, developmental psychologists use to mark what they call a higher stage of development because, and it's only higher it's in the sense that it's, um, in the sense that it's advanced, in the sense that it can do more than the previous one. I mean, if you think right. of, if I have like three things and A can do one thing, and B can do everything A can do plus one, and C can do everything that A and B can do plus one more thing, <laughs> then it's actually more developed than A or then C is more developed than B and B is more developed than C because it can do everything the previous can and something else. Well, the same thing goes kind of with the, uh, our changing awareness, you know, with, and so, you know, we're talking and we're, the point of the conversation today is self-awareness. And mm -hmm. so, I think it's really important to at least be aware, <laughs> where do you come from? You know, what, right. what conditions have shaped your mind up until this point? Right, what map are you using to look out on the world? You know, and confusing the map with the territory is, is the classic phrase. Um, I think that came from NLP, but I'm not entirely sure if that's where it began. But it's been a very helpful phrase for me to, to understand this shift and understand how this, this works in my life is, um, you know, we all have certain maps, as I mentioned, uh, I've used this before. And, um, what do you mean by maps, just so? Well, I mean uh, a fundamental way that we understand the world that we look out on, a, fund a fundamental um, orientation that right. we have. Like certain the, ideas that we believe that this is, we believe this is how things are, and this is our, our framework for understanding. That's our map for understanding. Absolutely. And that's, that may not be, it may, that, that map may not match exactly what actually is out there, the territory. So we all have a right. map, that's how we see it, and a territory, you know, hopefully, I, we think that it's an objective universe out there, regardless of how we all see it. So. Right, exactly, exactly. And I think the initial question is, you know, what is your map? What is your fundamental uh, way of understanding the world and it could be cultural it could be personal it could be religious or it could be a mixture of all these things that have come together to, to form what your personality is you know at your current uh, position um, and it's a question of looking at that map I think and then trying to trying to find the biggest map available you know trying to develop a map that includes all of the territory and mm. 
and doesn't just focus on on the things that have meaning for you currently, but is a way for you to expand your definition of what has meaning for you in your, in your experience. And I know that uh, a, a writer that we've both uh, connected over, and certainly when we first met, it was one of the writers that we initially uh, came came to conversation through. Uh, was Ken Wilber, you know, and and he he's definitely been fundamental in my. Uh, in my kind of integration of different maps, as I as I mentioned, I when I stopped being a Christian, I then jumped into the identity of being an atheist, and I thought, okay, Christianity is not for me. I'll throw that off the table and 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 just grab onto the next one. And and I was very uh, very sure of my atheism for I don't know six months, eight months, you know. And then <laughs> and then I was, but I was studying religion at the same time. I was still curious about how other. Uh, how other cultures and how other wisdom traditions defined meaning and, and defined, you know, what their how they understood the territory, you know, that I was looking out on initially as a Christian and then as an atheist, and then eventually coming back to okay, perhaps these these traditions do have something to tell me about how I can find meaning, um, but also how do I integrate that with? Well, I think psychology has something to say for this, and I think that uh, certain atheist ideas have something have value to give to this, and I think. People from from Buddhism have certain uh, ideas that are very helpful and practices. And how can I use them all together? They seem to be different maps looking out on different territories. How how can I possibly be all of these things at the mm. same time? Is, is that a possibility, or do I have to just be one of these things? Do I have to define myself as a singular entity? And Ken Wilber definitely helped me to to see how these things could come together and how different people at different stages of development. Are probably going to be more amenable to different ideas right and you know so you bring up a really good point and i i kind of want to come back to this and then kind of mention another parallel um mm. you know you talked about how uh, you know i think when you first break free of that first uh mindset and then you sort of you know for you it was christianity and then it was like whoop, swing right over to atheist and then it was like no right. bam this is my only one and so you think you're kind of free you go from one like a monkey swinging from a branch which a uh, right. monkey mind is yeah. is you know a a metaphor used for our mind of it like a monkey we hang on to one thing and then you don't really let go of it till you grab you find another one you grab onto that one right, and, right, right. and then you kind of realize uh wait a minute I, I just went from one only one to another only one and then real but that kind of shift right where you like let go of the first one you kind of create some a looseness of a, a mental mm-hmm. <laughs> mental agility now that you can let let you figure out how to let go for the first time right and and, and the, but the thing is as you say the mind kind of has momentum that it's like you swing out of one. You don't just let go of one identity and, and you have no momentum with you. No, you're actually you're kind of swinging, as you say, from one identity to another. And that feeling of being in midair, you know, as you're like reaching <laughs> for the next branch, it's kind of like I need to grab something. You know, I, need, I can't just I can't just be, you know, in midair flying through the air. Uncertain. Right. You know, I need to I need to have something that I can grasp onto, as you say. Right. And, uh, and and so, you know, there's and uh, I imagine, though, and I think this happens to pretty much everyone as well. It's a very common you know, nobody hates smoking more than a refined, uh, a, a reformed smoker, someone who just quit. Right. And, someone who quit yesterday. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. like, oh, I can't, I, I hate smoking. Oh, it's the, it's the, it's the, what you get, the bane yeah. of the world. And right, right. similarly, I, I imagine your experience is the same. Like as soon as you came out of Christianity, I'm sure you weren't just like, oh, well, you know what? Oh, my Christian brethren, I'm still going to op- welcome you back with open arms. You, right. how, how did you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I clearly had a vested interest, you know, in, in denouncing my previous identity, you know, when it's, a, as you say, it's a funny thing, like with the, the smoke is a good analogy. As soon as you, when, you know, I used to smoke and the way that I, I quit was I had to go through something of a, of an identity shift, you know, because I identified as a smoker when mm. it's a funny thing that, that, that happens when you, you start smoking, you know, and cigarettes obviously don't taste good, but you, you smoke enough of them where you, you start to create the need for them. And then, Oh, okay. Now I'm a smoker because I need to smoke. It's not like, I'm not forcing myself to smoke. I actually, I'm looking for my cigarettes now. Right. And and then it becomes just part of your life, part of your routine. And I tried to quit many, many different times. And the time, but I never really changed how I thought of myself hmm. until the time that I actually did quit. And I was with uh, my girlfriend at the time and my friend. We're outside a, a national park here in Thailand. It's about five years ago now. And we were going to go into this beautiful national park with beautiful clean air and surrounded by nature and trees and you know very different to Bangkok and a totally different setting. And I, I was smoking a cigarette and I kind of thought out loud, you know, and I said, oh, I think this is, might be my last cigarette, you know, and my, my friend and my girlfriend kind of looked at each other and smirked and, and <laughs> laughed, you know, could barely contain their, 
their their laughter at the, the idea that I would just you know quit just like that on on the spot while you know, smoking. And, <laughs> while smoking, right? And yeah, I think I'm like, going to quit smoking right now. Yeah, and then, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and something shifted. Something just like a door kind of closed or a mechanism just like locked, and I was like, oh, that's done. That's it fine. You like, over the edge. I'm no look right, and and I. I, fe- I felt that that swing happen, you know, and, and I was, it wasn't an issue after that. It was just like, oh, okay, I'm just not a smoker anymore. I, right. I have shifted. And although you do say, and I think that has uh, an important kernel of truth, that you don't have to leave your culture, you don't have to leave your setting, or you don't have to leave where you're located in order to go through one of these shifts. But I have found a parallel between being in a different place. You know, right. I had to kind of leave Bangkok on this, on this micro level of, of identity shift, you know, going from a smoker to a non-smoker, I had to kind of leave that setting and be in a, in a different place. You know, even though I was in the same country and I was in, I was in the same headspace, you know, I, I was in a different geographical location. And right. that is helpful, I think, sometimes. Yeah, I too. think, uh, and I... I what, so, I, you know, when I stopped being a Christian, I was at university. I right. wasn't leaving the country, but I that's was in what, a different place. Right, know, that's it, what I mean. I, like, you don't have to, uh, you know, you because know, we've, ex- we've had pretty major shifts that have been you know very closely attributable to you know leaving the country and spending mm-hmm. years in other places um but what i meant to say is that you know it, it is definitely helpful if you if you're in a community that's kind of you know your community has shaped you up until this point right and so right. if you know like you said you can't see how it's shaping you until you get out of there but you don't have to necessarily you know jump ship leave country right even just like entering another subculture of that uh yeah, a subculture a counterculture a, a new friend group a new a new activity group joining a new gym starting to hang out at the library starting to ha- find a juggling group a music group whatever it is there's so many ways to you know step away from that initial uh that initial headspace that shaped your you know shaped who you are and it doesn't have to be running across the world um you know my experience was also i i, I say the second major shift you know one was that going to paraguay identifying noticing specifically over the activity of football and being like you know why do i identify with them instead of them and and then looking around at these people in paraguay and actually thinking wait a minute they want their team to win so much more than i want my team to win like i could care like i could basically don't really care about this activity so now go paraguay like yeah you want it i want it for you like i hope i yeah, like okay. i really i want it more for you you know and now all of a sudden my identity started to shift in that way and mm-hmm. I also had another, a um, couple years later, I got the opportunity to live a year in Buenos Aires. And actually, mm-hmm. it, it must have been like four years later because another World Cup <laughs> was going on at the same time. And uh, But there in, in Buenos Aires, I, I met a friend who was one of the first people to like actively question my my values. You know? And he right. was you know he was very strongly identified as a socialist. And me just coming from America, I was unknowingly identified with capitalism in a way that I didn't even know what capitalism was. If you like, Hey, Jeremy, what's capitalism? I'd be like, I have no clue. Like what is right. there, what would be a different thing to capitalism? And I'd be like, I can't right, even right. imagine that, like, that that's my water right now. I can't even fathom a possibility of a organizational system that's different than how things are. How could things be different? And you know, he basically systematically broke down every like un- unexamined assumption that I had. And every time and yeah. it was easy to find them, he would say something, I would react and he'd be like, why do you think that? And it would be like, <laughs> we drive down into it. And I'd be like, you know what? I don't really know why I think that. And I can't source, I can't source where this came from. I just know that I think this, but I don't know why I think this or where this came from. And so my shift kind of went from, you know, uh, my nationalism of American kind of broke open. And, but really like my, my operating system was capitalist and he like, well, pretty soon I went from latching onto the capitalist branch to latching onto the socialist branch. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, well, socialism is kind of the only way. And why I'm st- I still have a lot of influence from that lens, I've also seen how, you know, that's probably not the only right way either. <laughs> how right. there's probably uh, elements of, you know, that perspective that would certainly enhance the well-being and quality of life for people all around the world. And that's undeniable. Um, but is that the only way or is that the is does it have to be exactly as, you know, the quote unquote Marxist socialists see it? It's mm-hmm. like, I don't know if that is something I can support at this point either. Is there something that's, you know, integrating uh, integrated perspective that's even, you know, beyond socialism, beyond capitalism, uh, you know, where our identity is not just to our country, to our group, but in some way that we can sort of identify with, uh, you know, the, kind of this planet as a whole. And, you know. I'm not sure what that if there's a clear answer to that yet, but I do know that 
I went from that shift from one thing, like you mentioned, from the from the religious to the atheist, and then to sort of open. I went from sort of like the unknowing uh, capitalist to the knowing socialist, and then sort of like questioning all and and sort of, you know, this path from one to the other to open to many paths is I think one that's common to development and to ultimately to like becoming our <laughs> the best versions of ourselves because, you know, in some situations. You know, a religion is just one way to look at existential problems, um, to find answers to our existential questions. And there's value in that. I mean, you said, you told me one time that uh, <clears throat> when you were younger, that how basically, especially when I think it was like before you were 15, you sort of always had that lens that, you know, I'm sure God is watching me right now. And so mm-hmm. you were sort of always, ref- you were, that, that perspective made it so you were always reflecting on what you were doing through the perspective of God, through the perspective of like, of like true perfection. And, you know, whether or not that, whether or not if God exists objectively, because you, that's your mindset, you were actively reflecting on your actions. Right. Well, you know, I didn't necessarily have that sort of self-reflection when I was, you know, I was like so positive that, that this wasn't a factor that I didn't even have to waste any thought thoughts on this. So Mm -hmm. there was value. It seemed, I mean, you're one of the most, uh, one of the most thoughtful people, most empathetic people I know, really, I'm really one of the most empathetic people I've ever met. And I'm sure that sort of this self-awareness, self-reflection, uh, that kind of was got ingrained in your like operating system from all the way down from when you were young, I'm sure it, it must have played a role in, in sort of conditioning your ability to reflect now and on into the future. So the point is that there's value in that. And even if it's, even if that one tradition doesn't have the entire the entirety of every solution possible to every to every question you could ever ask. The point is that it's also not valueless. <laughs> sure, absolutely, absolutely, man, and well said, and thank you for <laughs> thank you for your kind words. Uh, so, just in the last couple of minutes, Jeremy, let's bring this down to actionable steps. What yeah. can people actually do to become more self-aware? What can they? How can they increase the the size of their map to understand you know the widest range of territory possible? Right. What would you? Say? So. There are definitely some steps that anybody can take immediately in order to sort of get a uh, enhanced grip on self-awareness. Mm-hmm. Uh, number one is certainly just a meditation practice, like we mentioned before, just being aware mm-hmm. of thoughts as they arise. But a little bit more formal practice. Uh, well, I mean, if you do a formal meditation practice, but another formal practice is to actively reflect on your values. That is mm-hmm. to you know ask yourself these questions like. Why, what do I think? Can I explain my worldview? Like, you know, how, how are things? <laughs> what, what, what is the basis of nature? What is the bait? Like, how do I see the world? Uh, right. If you can't explain that clearly, then you, then you probably don't understand how you see the world. And right. that's not a problem, but that's definitely a place to start to dive into. I that's would highly good. recommend a writing habit because writing is thinking. Some, mm. some people think that, oh, you know, I, I just can't like express myself in words sometimes. And, and that's true for sure. But at the same time, we feel confident that, we, that we're standing on solid ground when we're thinking these thoughts. But so that's kind of a cognitive illusion. <laughs> if until we can really explain and, and say really what you're thinking, it's not likely that you really know where you're coming from. So mm. You know, there's some reflective questions that are really helpful and that to really answer in the form of writing is a very strong place to kind of get a grasp on self-awareness. And that's... Where can people find these kinds of questions? I'm going to post, uh, I'll post a link in the video description in the show notes down below so that you guys have a list of some reflective questions. Some of the questions include things like, you know, what are the values of the community that I come from? You know, what do the people generally believe where I come from? And, and if you don't know the answer, maybe a Google search is a place to start. You know, what, for example, what are common American values? What are common English values? What are common Thai values? What are common Christian values? And then compare your values to those values. Hey, do I agree or disagree? Uh, and really identify your values. Like, do, what do I want my values to be? Mm. And we can take this a lot farther in especially... This is an exercise that really has no limit in any direction you take it. So whatever way that kind of a stream of consciousness writing and just getting as many ideas out there at first is a good place to go. But the next step is one of the next steps is certainly to also think about what kind of person do I want to be? You know, what, Mm. what kind of values do I, 
do I want to have? Um, you know, I definitely had a moment in my life where I was like, yeah, I'm a good person, right? And I re- looked around me all of a sudden and thought, wait a minute. If I'm a good person, like I think I'm a good person, would I really be doing this, this, and this? Would I really be treating people around me like this, this, and this? Um, And I realized like, hey, wait a minute, I'm not the type of person that I want to be or that I expect myself to be or that I hope to be in the future. And I really had to take a few moments uh, over the course of years and really figure out like, hey, what kind of person do I want to be? And how would a person like that act? And- how is what I'm doing different from that right there? And this starts to give us uh, a point of reference, a self-awareness of where I am, a point of reference of where I think I might want to move from here in the future. And then once we have those two points, it's really a lot easier to start connecting the dots and moving our, to move ourselves towards the type of people that we want to become. So that's where I would start right. there. We'll give you some uh, more connection in the show notes down below. Do you have any thoughts, final thoughts, Simon? Uh, no, I think I think you said it well. It's a, a question of really identifying your initial map. What is the what is the orientation with which I look out on the world? And once you've identified that, it's much easier to then move in the direction uh, that you choose and start to really author your own life, as as you've mentioned previously. So that's uh, that's the first step, right. certainly. And it's a, and it's a constant process. It's not a question of oh, now I'm self aware. It's a, it's not a permanent state. It's really a thing that flashes on my my screen rather than rather than being a constant state of awareness um but the more that you can the more that you can articulate uh, what your map is uh, the much clearer it'll be uh, and then afterwards you'll be able to then move in the direction that you choose rather than that has been chosen for you right just so just know like really simply put try to be able to source where your thoughts beliefs and values come from if, if you find yourself saying something often like uh proposing a certain ideas commonly, I would recommend asking yourself, hey, wait a minute, where did I get that idea? Because if you don't know where you got that idea, then this is an, un, uh, an, un, uh, an assumed value. It's an overlooked value that you haven't examined yet. So that's a great place to start. So thank you guys for joining us today. We're going to wrap it up there. If you're enjoying these videos, go ahead and, uh, and these podcasts, go ahead and click, click subscribe below. Go ahead and check out precisionprinciple.com. we got lots more information on topics of awareness, self-awareness, thriving. How do we take our lives and just our abilities to the next level? Join the game and we will see you next week here on the Art of Awareness podcast. My name is Jeremy Sutton. And I'm Simon Dalrymple. And you guys keep learning, keep growing, and just make every day count. All right, dude.